Hi there. In this demo, we're going to be simulating the trunk, the ears, and tail of this elephant uh, using dynamic joint chains to add dynamics as, as well as procedural secondary motion. Now, it's a static elephant, and if I'm to go in and play this, I've already uh, pre-authored the, the chains themselves. So, so if I play this, you're going to see that our trunk and ears and tail are moving. We've got this... Um, tail wagging effect, the ear flapping, as well as the trunk moving upwards and downwards. These are all completely procedurally generated using our dynamic joint chains and going through the dynamic simulation for the secondary motion. Now to demonstrate how we've set this up, I'm going to grab the trunk and take you through the settings. Uh, we have a similar setup for the ears as well as the tail. Now if I select this trunk, in our sources, we have the nose, the base of the nose as the root element. Uh, then we've uh, generated or processed the chain to generate these particles. We've got a gravity in the uh, negative y direction as well as in the forward direction on the z-axis. We've got a very sm a small value for mass inertia, which will make it try to, um, you know, push the particles towards their initial configuration. We're using joint limits at a weak strength of 0 0.3 so that we're using them as soft limits. We've got two capsule colliders that represent the, uh, the bounds of the trunk, just roughly. You just we drag them into our native collider section. We've got a radius of 0 0.1 for each particle. And finally, we have a dynamic forces component, which, you know, dynamic chains, as long as a dynamic forces component coexists on the same game object, the chain is going to grab the forces from it and layer them on top of the gravity. Now, the force that we've got is a single force. It's a sine wave progression to get the forward and backward effects. In the, um, for, in the 0 0.5 in the y-axis, one in the z-axis, it's got an amplitude of three a frequency of four a long time, and it's generating this motion back and forth. Now we've got a global strength multiplier set to one. If I gradually decrease that to zero, you'll see that we're removing the effect of this force. Now only gravity is operating. I can go into our gravity and set the z-axis to zero. So now we're only operating in the y-axis downwards. Uh, in our dynamic properties, we've got a tiny amount of drag, damping is at 1, spring strength is at 2.5. We've also enabled prevent stretch, which will force the bone lengths to be preserved. However, uh, and particularly for an organic shape uh, object such as this trunk, which is soft, if I remove pre prevent stretch, then the particles will um, stretch and their bone lengths can change under duress and gravity. So I'm going to remove then you'll see because gravity is acting, it stretches it. If I have a weaker force, there'll be a lot less of a stretch. So I'll, I'll keep that. And it's modulated by um, the stretchiness, meaning the more the stretchiness, the greater the value of that, as you can see, as well as the stiffness, which the stiffer, the more reluctant it is to stretch. To, um, and the less stiff, the, the softer and that kind of thing. So if I move this up and down, you'll see that, you know, we're stretching, it's behaving more like a rubber band. Likewise, you know, in the forward and backward direction, you'll see it's, um, it's simulating, but it has that stretch. So the effect is a bit different. Um, so yeah, but in our case, let's keep prevent stretch. Um, finally, I move this back to where it was, I'm going to now demonstrate inverse kinematics with the trunk. So if I select the um, the end particle, a section is revealed in the inspector. I can um, select a target constraint for that particle, which is selected. I'm going to set. I'm going to select inverse kinematics. Now I've already pre-created this uh, game object called trunk ik target, and I I dragged it into the ik target section here. But you could do it manually for that specific point as well. So I'm going to press inverse kinematics. And you see, um, yeah, the target transform is that IK target. 
Now I can um, move this target and IK will be operating, driving that point towards this target while the dynamics are still running. So we're still going through that dynamic simulation and we can still get that secondary motion. I'm going to increase the drag here to increase that resistance to get less of the springy effect while we're going towards our inverse kinematics target. And yeah, as you can see, we're moving towards our target. We've got a good range of motion, but it's also limited by the joint limits. Uh, furthermore, we're affected by the, um, we, we respect collision limits as well, even in our IK step. So all of these things are happening at once. There you go. Just sliding this around the collision limits just to show just the power of it. Let's bring the trunk from the other side, from the underside of the joint limits. And likewise, it'll try to respect it. It'll bias outwards from, from the colliders. As you can see. At the same time, it's respecting uh, twist limits. So if I take uh, joint limits, rather, if I grab this particle and say, go to game object of the base, which rotates it, um, you'll see we've got a dynamic joint limit swing twist. Our twist is entirely clamped, meaning we're not allowing any twist in that joint. We're allowing only a swing rotation. But if I change that swing rotation limit, let's say I clamp it entirely, you'll see that that joint no longer is allowed to twi swing and the other joints have to compensate in their swing and their rotations for us to reach that IK target. But if I increase it, then yeah, it's free to move. Gravity will act on it, and then we could still reach our target, but with more of the dynamics applied. Now, this is quite powerful because it means that we can run IK, which looks a bit physical, you know, with the dynamics running at the same time and as well as responding to collisions and so on. But while pre preserving the structure of the trunk of the elephant, because you'll notice that we're not collapsing in, an, in on ourselves when we're doing IK for the trunk, especially as we approach those limits, as you can see. Now, to demonstrate what I mean, I'm going to set the, I'm going to disable the use of joint limits. And when we, when we do so, if I start moving this trunk target around, you'll see it now behaves like a piece of string. There's no regulation as far as the uh, limits of uh, twisting each of the joints, which means they can over twist. And over time, they'll completely uh, lose the structure. Uh, when we twist too much, especially for a skin mesh, you know, there's no longer any structure. And it looks very odd and it collapses in on itself. So that's the power of using joint limits, uh, which is something which is a USP of this tool, which I don't think any other tool supports when running dynamic simulations of this sort uh, without going through a, a physics engine whatsoever. This is purely, um, we're talking about, you know, running a very cheap dynamic simulation. Even here, like the, the frame rate is quite high. They're, it's really not that expensive. It's performance and we're using particle verlay integration and so on. So yeah, so with that said, I'm going to return the use of limits. I'm also going to um, press none on the target constraint. And I'm going to restore those forces gradually. So we can have that propagation backwards and forwards. Yeah, actually, one more thing I want to demonstrate is if I remove those forces, if I set the um, the initialization from to uh, source animation instead of static pose. So let's try that. And then I actually enable the animation of, of the elephant. You're going to notice that, you know, now that the, the elephant's actually animated and we're running these things on top, these simulations on top for the um, ears and trunk. If I disable uh, this component entirely, 
then you'll notice that our, in our initial, um, the animation drives the trunk in this motion. You know, it kind of curves it. Now, if my initialization from the source animation and I enable or I add an inertia strength, let's say we add an inertia strength of three, what that does is it actually takes the source animation positions and then it drives forces on the particles in order to preserve their positions based on that source animation. And that includes, even if it's not static, even if, you know, the trunk is moving, then the inertia every frame will drive it to its desired location in the animation. And yet we're still getting that secondary motion, meaning uh, I could still interact with it or add additional forces. I could still have our forces back and forth, except for because the inertia strength is quite powerful, you know, it'll, it'll move back and forth while trying to maintain its animation position. So that's what happens when you use initialization from a source animation in combination with the inertia strength. We drive towards our um, animation position that way. So that's that. Thank you for watching.